Podcasting remotely can be a challenge, but it doesn't have to be. Zencaster's all-in-one web-based solution makes the process quick and painless, the way it should be. This podcast is made on Zencaster. Zencaster provides me clear, crystal sound, and gorgeous HD video. Not to mention it's easy to use even for my guest, and sometimes they're not that tech savvy. There's nothing to download. They just click on a link and we start recording. If you want the same easy experiences I do for all my podcasting and content needs, go to Zencaster.com slash pricing and enter the promo code marketing today, all lowercase, all one word. Again, that's Z-E-N-C-A-S-T-R dot com slash pricing and promo code marketing today. You'll get 30% off your first three months. It's time to start sharing your story too. You know, I've been talking about earned media value for quite some time on this podcast. My friends at Eisenberg have just raised the bar on earned media benchmarks with their social index. Social Index now gives you globally earned media values across a growing list of six geographies for all your KPIs across the top seven social platforms, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Snapchat, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube. You can now visualize these values for deeper analysis, and they have a look-back window over two years of historical comparisons. Social Index is updated daily. Don't get stuck with old data. Over 1,000 companies have used the Social Index to understand the ROI of their social campaigns. And if you work with a social agency, you should demand they incorporate earned media values into your reports. Get your earned media value for social content. Visit earnedmediavalues.com slash Allen. Again, that's earnedmediavalues.com slash A-L-A-N. For all of us, it's about predicting where the consumer is going and getting half of it right. One of the things we want to do is create ads that don't suck. Embracing change creates great possibility. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. Today on the show, I've got Michael Goodbody. He's the new CMO at Dave, and Dave is a leading neobank challenging the current banking players in the market. And on the show today, we talk about his pathway to becoming CMO at Dave, his background in journalism, financial services, and growth marketing, how he thinks about marketing and the success that can be attributed to neobanks in the space of financial services and what's driving that, frankly, specifically a focus on products, products that achieve what people are looking to do and counter the competition. We talk about the fintech space. It's a huge market with players like Cash App, Robinhood, to name a couple. And we talk about talent and what he's looking for for marketing talent at Dave. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Michael Goodbody. Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. So I don't get to say this in every interview, but I hear that I should never, never challenge you to a rugby match. So uh, tell me about this this rugby career, I think, that you had before becoming a marketer. Yeah, I think I think it's usually, you know, every time you introduce yourself uh, a new company or something like that, it's usually the first uh, fun fact that I go with, which is I, I'm pretty sure I have. So I played a lot of rugby as a kid, as you can probably hear. I'm, I'm, I'm from the UK originally and um, pretty uh, on, on the larger side, to put it that way, for anyone that meets me in person. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think, I think I might have claimed for the uh, shortest professional uh, rugby career, possibly even the shortest professional sports career, because I, um, I actually, uh, you know, as I said, said, sort of grew up playing rugby. And uh, after I got my sort of uh, worked in a couple of jobs uh, in the journalism field, and then sort of let, uh, actually got laid off from from one of them and was playing at a relatively highly sort of level of amateur rugby in, in London and one of my my sort of uh, teammates uh, was also an agent uh, and he ended up uh, sort of approaching me and asking me if I'd be interested in, in in sort of offering my services around for a professional t- 
teams in France, actually. So I ended up, yeah, getting a two-year contract to go play professionally in France, in um, in Saint-Nazaire, which is uh, sort of near Nantes, and uh, sort of took that on, moved out there, and, yeah, managed to... Uh, I, I ended up living there for, for a year, but managed to uh, break my shoulder in the very first sort of... Uh, I'm not even sure if it was the first training session or the first game. It was like a deteriorating situation. But, yeah, and ended up playing about 20 minutes and then sort of coming off and uh, getting surgery and, and, and sort of recovering from that and then deciding that maybe this isn't a great career uh you know if uh if you're you know 20 minutes into your first uh, your first first pitch presentation at an agency suddenly you just get some kind of debilitating um debilitating wound that stops you from performing so yeah that was that's my kind of claim to fame okay it's impressive even if it was short <laughs> right. So. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I mean, I think I got paid to do a sport, so I'm technically a former professional athlete. But you know, that's that. That it's it's very much a technicality. You mentioned, um, you know, having a role as a journalist before. Like, what was your path from from athletics? You paid athletics to uh, becoming the chief marketing officer at Dave. Yeah. I mean, I think particularly being like sort of running marketing at a, at a, a sort of a tech company, I, I definitely feel that my my pathway, you know, even beyond the the sort of sports. Side of things is is very unusual. As I, I sort of you know as I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, I started out actually you know my pretty much my entire like college career and and actually through through high school was was I wanted to be a sports journalist. My uncle and my grandfather were both uh, pretty famous like professional journalists, uh, sports journalists in the UK, and. Um, just never questioned that that was the direction that I was going in. And so I sort of went through university with that as my, as my uh, preferred route. And when I left university, sort of did a bunch of internships and then just started to look at that as a career and um, discovered fairly early on that uh, sports journalism, whilst it sounds amazing um, and is kind of a fun fun um, thing to do, is not a very well-paid way of getting into the professional world. So I sort of ended up looking at financial journalism as a sort of somewhere to actually you know in between get some money and uh and, and earn a decent wage but also you know stay true to that kind of career path that i wanted to go on and, and spend the first few years of my career as a financial journalist and then move from there and so i think you know my path has been dictated by that to some degree and i've moved from journalism i went into a pr agency from there i sort of started moving out more into kind of brand marketing and just gradually kind of added things on from that point, but always coming at it from the perspective of having had that like four or five years of getting pitched a lot as a journalist and and sort of being able to, to really sort of understand the story and really sort of see what pops out when when you're looking at any given kind of, uh, I guess, when you're looking at a situation, trying to, trying to really get through to the narrative, understand what the, what the consumer wants or what the reader wants. And that's been very important and helpful for me in my career. You know, I was a as a financial journalist, you have to be very data driven. You know, I did a lot of an analysis of sort of take A's and company results. And so I always had that kind of like storytelling through data as, as a core skill set that I learned early on. And it's been phenomenally useful for me as I've kind of broadened away from that and moved into performance channels and and, and other parts of the, the sort of marketing ecosystem. What was the transition from journalism into business? So I, I went I <laughs> I went from uh, I was the editor of mag- magazine briefly in the sort of financial technology space. And and uh, just decided I was. I sort of decided that wasn't quite the right place for me to be, and so I ended up going into a PR agency. So that was the first sort of move from like to the dark side, as everyone used to call it. And that side. And um, from there, I, I sort of I then you know was there for a year or so. Uh, went in house at an investment bank at the time, and then just if you think about you know 10, 15 years ago, it was all about you know back then you know communications and social media in particular. Like it, it ended up kind of being part of our world, and so you know, to some extent, there's still that 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 sort of connection today but that was sort of how i started to expand out was you know really sort of taking on moving from pr and comms into into sort of so like organic social and then from there you know bringing that into sort of more of the paid element and and then that was the sort of move the, the, the move from from more from purely earned media into paid media and then sort of growing uh, from that point gotcha well, and what brought you eventually, like what brought you to Dave and, and describe Dave too, for people that have been living under a rock. Yeah. Yeah. Living under a rock. Yeah. So I, I mean, Dave is a, Dave's a really interesting, I would say, you know, the way that we describe ourselves as a neobank, we're, we're you know, digital bank. Uh, we're part of the kind of fin- fintech ecosystem. Dave's about four or five, it's about four or five years old. And, um, you know, we started you know, back in, I think, 2017 by Jason, who's our CEO now and, and, and some other co-founders really targeting the um the kind of overdraft fees 
issue. So I think Jason has been hit really hard by, as I think a lot of us have been at different times in our life, by the fact that you know, you, you know, when you when you run out of money, you sort of dip into a, a, an overdraft and, and get charged thirty forty dollars for it. And so set up Dave as a way really to identify when you were going to go into that sort of overdrawn status and be able to give you access to short term liquidity. You know, fifty bucks, seventy bucks, just to sort of get you through that, so you didn't incur that fee. That was the original concept, and from there we kind of grew out over the last four or five years to be. You know, I think we have about six million members. We have you know about two million bank account uh, or, or, or debit users, and you know one of the leading sort of neo banks in in that finance space. And so we we're similar to. If you were to look at other other new entrants uh, like sort of Chime or um, you know some of the work that Cash App has done to move into that space as well, we sort of see ourselves in that in that sort of group of companies that are taking a core problem and trying to solve it with a, a degree of differentiation in financial services, and then from there earning that sort of customer relationship and, and, and building it out to become, you know, in, in, our, in our sort of from a strategic perspective, we we're looking to be in that primary banking relationship for our users um, over time. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, and uh, so you've, you've got a really interesting background, like journalism, covering financial services, now in financial services, and at the early stages of like social media, um, as you made that transition in the PR, like in your mind, do, do you think about those three things coming together? And like, how has that contributed to your success currently yeah absolutely i think i still remember when i first my i I guess the first of time that i moved you know that i really sort of broadened into pure into a when i moved into sort of tech from bigger companies was when i moved to transferwise which is a big international money transfer platform um you know kind of demo for for for, uh for international uh, remittances and um you know, was at that point in it, that was at the point in, in time where like Facebook was just launching video. And, you know, I think uh, a lot of TransferWise's early growth was due to our ability to really like crack that medium as it sort of exploded. And so I think a lot of my, my career has been sort of at that point where we sort of, where, where I've been able to be at companies that are able to take advantage of some of these new trends as they're rising in the market and understand the value of that and lean into it and, and, and build a business on the back of it. So, you know, that certainly happened at, at, uh, at TransferWise and we've seen it as well. Even I think with when I was at Credit Karma, I think they were they were early, early on before I got there, really cr- like I think a big part of their growth was sort of taking a performance marketing mindset and cracking TV and 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 sort of OTT and some of those channels as well. So I think uh yeah, just it's been interesting to see that and be part of, of those trends as they're coming. And we're seeing that now as well with things like TikTok and, you know, how you can you can build a brand, you can build a company on the back of like, you know, if you can be an early adopter of some of these things. Yes, for sure. And I mean, you're relatively new into the role of CMO. You, if I got my, my math right, you started in January, so you're roughly six months as we're doing this this uh, interview. How did you think about coming in to the role that you're in now and like goals, vision, et cetera? Like what were you thinking? Yeah, I mean, I think I had a really, I, I probably had the best foundational experience for for that move that you could possibly have. I was at Credit Karma for five years and I, I the last three or four years there was, you know, Credit Karma made a decision a year or so after I got there to kind of verticalize the business, to create, to reorganize the marketing department around core like verticals beyond just that having a centralized marketing infrastructure. And they're, they're at that scale point where it was kind of hard to, to do new things because there was so much of the brain space was being dedicated to just the existing business and, and growing the existing business. And so I actually moved over there early on to be the, uh, the sort of head of marketing uh, within the, it was a sort of lateral move to be the head of marketing for our tax business. At the time we launched Credit Karma Tax, which is a competitor to uh, TurboTax, actually not a lot of those sorts of companies. And so it was, was the first vertical market, market of Credit Karma. And, and through that, next three or four years was able to effectively, you know, grow that like and attach more, more responsibility and more like, um, you know, more verticals became part of what I was working on. And so by the end of that, I was actually kind of running a full stack marketing team, um, you know, 20 to 30 people. We had our own creative function. We had our own uh, growth marketing function. We had our own engagement function. So when I moved over to Dave, actually it didn't feel like a big, dip, a big step from that perspective because I, I sort of had the whole scope of a marketing organization under me. And in a very similar space, like Dave and Credit Karma are generally serving 
very similar types of users and users that have very similar types of problems. So I think when I came in, even though I'm relatively new to the CMO role, like I felt like I'd got a few, at least a few years of very direct experience on how to like run a team, how to run an organization, how to run strategy from the marketing and growth perspective. You know, and I think that that really helped me. And so in addition to that, I think I I come in, I came in today with this is the third fintech that I've been at that I've grown. And there's like a lot of commonality to what works in fintech and who's grown, who's been successful. And so I've been able to not just work at those companies, but also look at a lot of the companies around me and, and see how they were growing. And so I think for me, the first thing was to just come in and apply that lens of what has worked, what works in this space to what had been done at Dave and what was being done at Dave. And then look at, you know, where are the, where are the gaps and, and what do we need to change with that skill set and with that experience in mind? And so a lot of what I was doing early on was, uh, you know, again, I, 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 I can't, I, I guess I'm still early on, but there's been a lot, uh, we've, we've managed to achieve a lot in that time. And, and so a lot of that was about coming in and looking at, you know, how we go to market, how we, you know, the, the, the approach that we're taking, the, the, of technology that we've got in place, the channel mix that we've got in place, and just trying to assess that against what I know has worked for, for myself at other companies and also at other companies in the fintech space. And so really applying that. I think, and I think Dave, as an example, is, is a really interesting company from the perspective that I think they had extreme product market fit, right? So they came in and they launched this product. The, the, the root of the day is that, you know, you connect your bank account through Plaid and you're able, basically, we pull in your transaction and, and, and your income data from that and we run a machine learning algorithm against them. We're able to figure out pretty, you know, instantly kind of how much, how much, uh, money we're willing to advance you in that moment. And so, you know, this week we've just, we we'll talk about that in a minute, but we just increased the expansion of that up to $500. But effectively, if you think about it, we can, you come in, you sign up, you connect your bank account, we'll lend you up to $500 instantly. So that's a very, very strong value prop to acquire people. But I think going, you know, for me, when I came in and looked at where the company was at, I think they hit that, that moment of, you know, they had hyper growth and then that growth kind of, it, it didn't, stop but it wasn't hyper growth anymore for a bit of time and that was primarily actually driven by stimulus and just how much liquidity was pumped into the american economy that 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 made it a little bit less necessary for people to need products like dave and so it grew you know grew it still grew well but it wasn't growing at that that previous rate and i think what had happened to the company was that we looked at other pit players in the space and we looked at you know how do we how, how else can we grow and i think that's a quite that's a question that a lot of companies that get to that kind of to hyper growth and then sort of slight you know slightly leveling off will go through that moment of like how else can we grow how do we add something on and so the big thing for me when i came in was just like hey you've got like we're the market leader in this space we're the we're the best at what we do and so the most important thing for us is to stay focused on that and think about how we innovate and how we drive up that value prop and how we amplify that value prop for our, for our members and think about alternative alternative ways of engaging our existing users through the lens of like acquisition through our core value prop and going broad from that. I think every company in the financial services space certainly that has kind of grown fast over the last four or five years has taken that same approach. And it's pretty easy for me to be like, hey, there's a rule set here. Let's make sure we're following it. And and just making that slight tweak, I think, you know, made a lot of sense. There's a lot of buy-in internally and this has has been has been really fruitful for us to sort of really capture what what was what was there. Because at the end of the day, we had just an amazing product. For, like we had we had an amazing product. And so I think that's the you know, sometimes you can forget that when you're sitting in, you're sitting inside a company and I had the advantage of being outside and sort of looking in and being envious of what Dave was able to do and then coming in and having that perspective was actually pretty useful. Yeah, I think nailed it there at the end too. The value prop and the product was extremely, what you say, extreme market fit originally and, and like it allowed you to amplify that over time and now try to figure out how to how to take it to the next level. I mean, so you mentioned just this, I think you said just this week, you guys up, up to your limit to $500 that you're willing to extend to customers. I mean, to me, like I spent a little time in the credit card space. <laughs> you know, that feels like a move from like, hey, I'm just going to spot you, you know, 50 bucks. You're now like in the like, you're bumping into the what, was historically called like secured credit card space, right? Like, like small amounts of lending, but it allows you to build credit essentially. Do you guys see like you're moving into that space or the credit lending space in general versus being a neo bank? Or is it just an extension of your existing banking products in your mind? Yeah, I, I think that anytime you want to grow, like the root problem for any company that's been trying to like grow in financial services over the last 
probably, I mean, at least 20 years that I'm aware of, but like probably 50, 100 years, is inertia. And it's been the ability to actually differentiate enough to get somebody to move their bank account or their financial services relationship over to you. So if you think about it from that perspective and through that lens, you know, what is important as you come into, if you want to change that dynamic, a new entrant is to be incredibly good at one thing that's very important for a subset of people. And you, you know, you want to be able to solve one financial problem really, really well. And it's kind of, you know, and I remember when I met the first lunch I had with Christo, who was a CEO at TransferWise when I got there. And he sort of, his uh, analogy was the Gmail, Hotmail kind of transition. And not maybe some people remember that, I remember that. But, you know, it, there was this idea that like Gmail gave everyone that 10x better product, right? 10x better storage. And it made it a no-brainer to switch over. And so I think in financial services, you know, when you're dealing with the product, like problem of inertia, the, the, most of the reason why there's a problem of, of inertia is because it's a very consistent set of products. It's very commoditized and people just sort of, you know, don't see clear differences between it. And so for us, it's about how are we 10 times better at something that's meaningfully important to people. So short-term credit, 67% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck um, right now. And of those, you know, fairly significant proportion are struggling to live paycheck to paycheck. So we think short-term credit, which is like, which is effectively figuring out ways of, of closing the gap between one paycheck and the ne next paycheck is primary financial need for about 25% of American adults. So what we have there is, is, there's definitely probably 50% of Americans that this is just irrelevant to uh, who don't have to worry about like whether they can fill up their car with gas or pay their rent or any of that sort of stuff. But, the, but to the audience that, that have to worry about that, like we want to be hyper relevant and we want to solve that core problem 10 times better than their existing bank. And then that allows us to develop that relation, like, like take that part of their relationship away from the existing system and, and, and grow that with them and allows us the opportunity to earn a seat at the table with that, with that consumer for the rest of their financial services needs if we can, if we can sort of service that. So, you know, as we think about launching $500, you know, I think, I think it's important. One of the things I think that, that we were limited by was previously we would lend up to $250. If you, by going to 500, you know, it's, um, it, it's, it's allowing us to service a broader set of users who, you know, A, there's that core need of like rent, utilities, gas, whatever it is that, you know, still is a problem for a large set of consumers, even in that $100,000 plus income bracket, but that maybe $250 doesn't quite stretch to cover that need. And so they use a different financial product, or it's also allows us to stretch up into, you know, more of the discretionary spend area as well. So what we're, what we're doing there is, you know, basically listening to consumers, listening to understanding what people want, which is, you know, access to uh, more money you know, sort of, and getting it quicker and solving that problem. And in so doing, you know, we, we're looking to expand that market, but it's not necessarily expanding it. I think what, when, you know, when, when I, I've talked to people about this in the past, it's like you're trying to move up market with it. It's, it's less about that. And it's more about just being relevant to a broader set of people who have the same set of needs. But, um, you know, in so doing, I think in some way moving, trying to move a little bit away from, can we just service the needs to the wants? And so seeing what happens there. So, you know, I think, for me, what's interesting about the product that we that we offer is we obviously advance you know up to five hundred dollars. It's, it's basically you know we we leverage any income data and transactional data that we have, so we can you know lend that against income like traditional income paychecks. We can le leverage it against sort of income from if you've got regular income coming in for a college student, get you know from your parents or from if you've got unemployment income. These are all things that we factor into our underwriting decisioning, and this allows us to kind of like take that up the next level and be able to kind of unlock that short-term credit for people that maybe might be looking at using a credit card or might be looking at using a personal loan to fund something. So we're interested to see how that how that changes. And I think that continues to be like, you know, we, we've, we've done 60 million advances now. So we have just so much data that we can push the boundaries constantly on what we offer and still drive the same return profile. And that's what we're looking to do. That's awesome. And fintech is a huge market and like so many competitors and in very different ways, right? You've got your area, which is like the neobanks, but you've also got the financial like 
investing platforms, et cetera. Not to mention probably not really fintech anymore, but you've got like cryptocurrency stuff that's kind of on the fringes of that. How do you continue to stand out in that market? Because I know you were early into the market, but I mean, I, and obviously it's m- like making these enhancements uh, in part, like like we just talked about, but how, how else do you think about it? In a way, it's simple. The, the strategy is really simple. Like when you write it on a piece of paper, it's like, oh yeah, that makes sense. And there's lots of pat- there's lots of like examples of like how it works. And reality, it's really hard. And I think that you know, again, if you wanna if you wanna earn, uh, you know if you wanna earn market share in finance, so I think I think financial services is going through that e-commerce moment. And some of that is it's probably a longer moment uh, than than maybe some of us were expecting in the industry. But we're going through this moment, this sort of like transitional shift towards online services, you know, because bricks and mortar are less meaningful than for that product than they have been. And I think that that is, you know, an inevitable shift that that, that is happening, will happen. And you know, I think what you've seen over the last few years with new entrants coming in is like the advantage of being able to play without like the bricks and mortar overhead to offer a financial financial services product. And so there's a lot of frothiness in the market that I think we're going to see shake out over the next couple of years. But the sort of core trend that we're seeing is very much that in the same way that it was unthinkable to buy, you know, I remember a time when I was like, I'll never buy clothes online. I will never buy shoes online. I have to go to a shop. On. Now I never do anything but buy those things online, and the industry solved that problem with like easy returns and fast shipping and stuff. So that's what's happening in in, in financial services is that we're a company with three four hundred employees and we can service ten million users, and we don't need bricks and mortar. We don't need we don't need that same overhead to sort of distribute our product and to drive trust. And what that allows us to do is provide like the sort of service that you and I are probably getting from our bank but to provide that to everybody. And I think that's been always the, the sort of the tension, particularly in America, is that you've got 14,000 banks, but you still have a massive underserved population. If you're lower income, lower credit, the sort of bottom 50% of America still still primarily gets monetized through fees and, well, mostly fees, to be honest with you, from the banking perspective, because they don't have enough money for the banks to sort of churn through and like earn by lending it out, which is generally money out of the, the higher higher income user base. And so for us, we're able to offer like that premium service to our, that user base at that lower income group, you know, at a much lower overhead cost. And that allows us to build a great business while still not nickel and diming and, and hitting you on hidden fees and charging thirty dollars every time you go overdraw overdrawn or any of that sort of thing. So that's the sort of the ecosystem shift that we're looking at. And then, you know, within that, what you're seeing is the way that again, customer acquisition has always been the biggest problem in financial services in terms of growing new brand. It's like it's a really hard thing to do because if you talk to most people when they, you know, when you're like, well, how did you, you know, people, people have got, you know, for the, the most part, will have a new, they'll get their bank account when two things happen, right? Their parents open it for them or they move somewhere and their existing bank is not, does not cover that area as well. And, and it's not geographically near enough. So they, they've gone with a different, different provider. Those are the two reasons you open a bank account. That's pretty much it. So with the, e, you know, the, the sort of the, the app, like, like with regional no longer being that important anymore, what it's allowed us to do is to think about it less about that, more about use cases. And so the companies that are doing really well in this space, like, you know, I think Cash App's a great example, you know, number one rated uh, financial service, n- number one downloaded financial services app and the app store pretty much every day, all day, every day. And they sold, again, if I think back when I moved to the US seven, eight years ago, and I was trying to move money from like, pay somebody back for something or if i was trying to move money from one account to somebody else's account like it was really hard it was this high friction thing and cash out and Venmo came in and solved that problem really really well 10 times better than the existing banks and build a user base from it you know credit karma did that with credit scores prior to them doing it, it seems crazy to think about that now because it's so commoditized but they did that with they took a, a fairly opaque score that was you know you had to pay to get or you had to sort of run these free trials that like would pretend free for a month and then ended up like hitting you with a (laughs) hidden you know like thirty dollar fee every month, yeah, yeah, right. It's like before, if you can, it, as soon as you notice that you're like, damn, this free thing cost me hundred bucks, and they they changed the dynamic of those industries by by again finding that one thing that was really burning a hole in the consumer and like solving it. And I think at, at TransferWise, where I was at before, that was the same thing. It was international money transfer, which just wasn't that important to the banks. It was like a 
you know, less than one percentage for most banks' revenue. And so they didn't care that much about it. They didn't want, you know, they provide the service, but it was pretty terrible. And so anyone that's done well in this space has has taken that core value, like taken that core problem and solved it really well. And, you know, Robinhood applies that and Coinbase applies that as it relates to like, you know, crypto. Obviously that's a new market, but still. And, you know, and on the other side, but 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 the other side of that is like you take that moment. And you solve that problem and suddenly you've got a customer that thinks about you within their financial services ecosystem. And then it's about cross-selling to that user base and broadening that relationship. And so, again, you see that with, with everyone that's been successful in the market. It's like, how do you force somebody out of their existing provider, bring them over to you with your core value prop? And then you know, actually the hard part in all of this is then the retention and the cross sell and you've seen a lot you know a lot going on there with credit karma i launched the money product which which was our sort of checking and banking account up to the tax service all these adjacent kind of cross sell type opportunities and you see that at robin hood as well with debit cards you see that at, at sort of um at chime with with their associated like credit products as well so so you see all of that happening that rebundling but it's about like how do you get somebody out their existing relationship to start off with and that's that's sort of is you look at the growth market, I do think fintech, you know, you're part of like a one-time inevitable shift that you can't really see happening in the moment because it's like a glacier. But like you wait five years and you look back and you're like, wow, that changed a lot. That's where we're at. That's what we're going through. And that the commonality of who's successful is all about being amazing at, at the core value. Problem. Well, how does that, how you're competing in the market today, like translate to what, like how, what does marketing look like? At Dave, how do you balance performance marketing, cross sell, upsell, and brand as a as like three different components? I guess. Yeah, I mean, I don't think anyone's purely solved it. <laughs> no, no, I'm sure. But, right. but if you have, this is the perfect show to tell everyone. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you know, there's definitely um, the way I think about it, and I, I, I it is that you need to build a brand like so so most of the companies that are in this space are heavily performance focused and that is part of you know again at the end of the day we are um because we're not charging fees to our users and we're sort of generate like every single dollar that we make um is is an optional dollar that the user has chosen to pay us for like added value of the core service like our, our actual core service like lending you money we don't charge anything for so it's completely free we make money off t- like half of our revenue is from tips so people tip us about 50 percent of people give us a tip when they when they uh take an advance so in that scenario the the biggest challenge that any of us have really and you look at robin hood as well like robin hood provides free trading it's a good example like our customer acquisition costs because we make so much less money at a user level um, because we're trying to strip out all of that cost from the system you know generally in fintech customer acquisition costs are very lean compared to every other every other sort of bank right and so banks typically will pay three, $400 for a user, we pay 20 and your typical fintech will be kind of in that 20 to, to 50 range. And that makes it hard to, that means you have to, you know, you have to look after the pennies. Otherwise, you, end up, you know, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of room in there. And that's, again, that's part of what we're trying to do. We're, so, we're serving underserved communities and we're providing them with, with great, you know, we're trying to provide them with great quality products, like top, you know, one percent type banking products, but we're doing it. We're trying to strip the cost out of the system, and marketing is part of that. So we don't want to be spending basically spending our users' money on marketing if we don't have to. So a big part of that is, you know, we definitely come from the perspective of performance marketing, and I think every company in the space, again, like heavily performance driven, credit karma, what transfer wise, like everywhere I've been has been like insanely like um, focused on that very data driven. The funny thing, but then the opposite part of that when you deal with it is that financial services are all about trust. Right. And so it, there's this tension, which is you can kind of win people over with performance marketing. You can acquire them to some degree, and there's always low hanging fruit in that market. But in order to retain and expand that relationship, you're, it's about building trust. It's about building longevity, like, like, like a sense of longevity. Like people don't want to give money to, to a company that they think is three years old and it's going to disappear in 10 years or in five years or in two years. And so that tension exists in everything that we do so i think for me when you see the stage of fintechs of, of, of growth in this in this marketplace a lot of it is about early on it's about like hey do, let's get signal on product market fit like are we you know is there a there there and then you can pour a certain amount of gasoline on that just through performance marketing but then it becomes about like how do you do it in a way that builds a brand i would argue credit karma is a great example of that having been been able to work with some amazing marketers and, and executives there you know i learned a ton from 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 sort of great as the CMO there and 
yeah, I think the the way of thinking about that, that sort of journey, the way I look at that is like they applied a, a brand layer on top of performance marketing, but in a way that still allowed everything to be efficient. Think about customer acquisition, but as you gradually like mature as a company, you think about how you layer in brand into that. So it's not about having a separate brand marketing budget for these for us at this point in time and separate brand marketing mindset. It's about thinking about how do you create user act like ads and assets that acquire but how do you do that in a way that like leaves a mark that's ownable and i think that's what a lot of companies do really badly when they're looking at performance marketing is you think purely about i want to acquire the user i want to drive the click and you don't see and nobody can tell if it's an ad from you or your competitor that means you're just investing in that click and you're not in the, for every eyeball that doesn't click you're not doing anything and i think that's that's what how i think about that that the approach is like, how do you, and the big thing that I've been trying to do today since I've got here is like, yeah, you know, how do we make sure that everyone that sees our ad, like it still performs, right? It's still driving acquisition. It's still driving usage, but that it, it, it's also ownable and that you can't just strip off the logo or strip off the, the sort of um, the brand name and just, and, and not know whether it's us or one of 10 competitors. And that's a really important way of thinking about like how to do that. Like that next phase of growth. Well, that, I mean, that kind of takes me right into the next question I had for you, which is like, what type of talent are you looking for that, to actually do that? That, I mean, it definitely creativity is one aspect, but like, tell me a little bit about like the type of marketing talent you're looking for. Yeah, it's interesting. I think, you know, I think generally as well, you know, I think my read of this would be that, you know, marketing went from certainly in the space I'm in, went from being, an art to a science, right, over the last 10 years. And as the platforms that we market on and the ways that we apply, like increasingly do a lot of the science for you, in a particular terms of algorithmic bidding and value, um, value bidding, value optimization, et cetera. You know, that then, to me, what I'm seeing is the need to be able to straddle both of those worlds. So when I'm looking for talent, you know, I'm either looking for creative growth marketers who understand the value of creative and understand how to differentiate through the look and feel, or it's sort of data-driven creatives. And uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not that easy to find them. But, you know, that's where you get, to me, that's where you get the true unlock. Like, I think if you end up, if you're not trying to think through that lens, then you do end up, you tend to end up like swaying the company one way or the other. And then it becomes up to, you know, my experience is kind of up to me or up to other sort of leading executives to try and like keep the balance, keep the harmony, which is really hard to do. Like, I've, you know, even at the companies I've been at, I've seen like the way that you hire talent swaying you in one direction or the other. And, it, and you almost need to keep it on that fine balance between the two. So, you know, the, 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 I think the way I think about it is, you know, when you, when you're, when you're hiring, you're looking for inquisitiveness. You're looking for like light behind the eyes. You're looking for passion. You're looking for just the ability to dig deep in the topic and just sort of think laterally. So to me, it's less about like deep, deep expertise in what you're doing. And it's more like a certain type of person that's willing to, that's just inquisitive about the nature of their work and willing to learn and expand that mark, their, their view of them. I mean, the notion of, um, how you described them, creative growth marketers or data-driven creatives. At the first outset, I was like, aren't those the same things? But they're not, but they're they're very close to each other. Like I could I could see how they would work well together if you're trying to build a team, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I think they're actually really different, I think, in my mind. Tell me more about it, because I, I wanna I wanna make sure I understand it completely. Yeah. So I mean, one of the things that one of the, the, the things I, I think I saw, it's not really something that's scalable, but like I think where I've seen this at its best is sort of like I would take my creatives um, who were working on some of our, you know, sort of like building building our, our creative assets when I was uh, at Transferwise and I would have them run Facebook campaigns so they could, because, you know, they would, and they hated it, <laughs> they really hated it. But what it allowed them to do was just see how they could interpret like the performance of that creative through the data. And a creative will look at something in a very different way to a performance marketer. Like a performance marketer will look at like relative performance of different assets. And they'll be like, this is better than this, right? This one drives better conversion than this. This drive, they'll look at the underlying con- like, you know, metric that they're sort of looking at and they'll, they'll, they'll figure it. But they generally speaking won't know why. They will just say this one works better than this one. And so the true unlock is when you can look at creative and understand why it's doing something better. And, and, and so a good example of that is, you know, I remember showing somebody that one of the creatives like the data and they were looking at it and it's like, Oh, well this one, you know, this one has, 
you know, the view curve on it, like in terms of when people are dropping off, they could identify exactly when people started dropping off and the creative like shift that was happening there or the pacing and they tighten that up. And that then retains the user through that whole, whole journey or that whole asset, that whole grid. And so that, that ability to be like, that wasn't something that, you know, that, that, that I think that the growth marketers on the team were even thinking about, like they were just looking at this and being like, okay, okay like just wouldn't even occur to them that after four seconds, people are dropping off. They're like, well, they don't like the ad or they like it, but they don't like it that much or whatever. But the, but the creative is able to look at it and be like, what happened then? And so I think that that's a good example of like a creative different sort of being able to look at it through the data. And then I think on the other side of it, it's, it's more about, it, it often becomes more about like being able to identify the types of assets that are performing. I, th- I, th- I think it's unlikely that a growth marketer will ever get that deep in like how an asset works, but well, they might, but that, but when you, when you sort of hiring growth, like um, creative minor ones, they're much better at looking at like what the competitive set is doing and identifying types of creative that work. And they're much better at like, divide, like looking at maybe how their work is doing and just try and understand like the sort of types of creative or the, the different sort of, I guess, sort of platform, like the different types of asset that might work for a particular platform or something like that. But that tends to be the breadth of it. Um, I haven't seen too many people that can close the gap between that. No, it makes sense. I appreciate you going a little deeper there. And if there are data-driven creatives or creative growth marketers listening, check out Dave. Absolutely. 100%. <laughs> <laughs> me an My LinkedIn is open. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. One of the things we like to do on this show is uh, get to know you a little bit more. We know you, you had one of the shortest professional rugby <laughs> careers of all time. But uh, but beyond that, has there been an experience of your past that defines or makes up who you are today? Yeah, I mean, there are obviously plenty. I think professionally for me, it's it was um, it was making the wrong decision on a like I think for anyone out there that like ever gets like in a bad situation from a work or is it or is down about like a, a work decision that they've made or like a, a job that they've taken that doesn't turn out like I would say that's a very that's probably the the most important experience you'll ever have in your career (laughs) and so for me i think that's true in particular you know i think um i work for some big companies up front and and you know part of the my push into like more of the sort of marketing mix and the text text, uh, you know the, the, the sort of last 10 years of my career were like very much dictated by me making the wrong decision about like moving to a company and and working for a company that didn't necessarily have the same values that I have. And I think for me that that was that was very transformative in, in my professional career. It was just understanding that like, you know, particularly when you're market you're a marketer and and particularly back then, because I still own some of that element of comms and and sort of communication and positioning and brand, like it's really hard to represent the company, be that representative, that face of a company if you don't believe in what they do. And so that, that to me was a tra- big transition point. I'm not going to name the company, but definitely I remember joining and within like a week being like, oh, this isn't what I imagined it to be. And so, you know, I would say go out there and, you know, make a big decision and make it badly and fail fast. And it really helps you understand what's important to you and in, in terms of what you want to learn and, and where you want to grow. And that, and that was the big big thing for me was like just making that wrong career decision because it, it allowed me to sort of take a you know massive pay cut to go and do what I wanted to do and then from there I've got you know I was able to grow a career in a different direction really fast I'm you know much happier about now that's awesome if you had advice for your younger self starting this journey all over again what would it be if I had <laughs> so probably go go and be an engineer a software engineer I, I think it would be a um, advice I'd give to anyone like 10 years ago rather than be in, be in marketing or any other any other discipline but no i i mean yeah i i think it's hard because i think you know i definitely am a person that like i'm sure if i came back in time and told myself something i wouldn't believe myself you know i'd have to i'd have to make the mistake myself and like get there in my own way but i think again like the most the, the, for me it's like there, there are two things that two or three rules that I, a piece of advice that I give people on my team, which is that I would always give to myself as well, which is don't be afraid to like dive into something that's broken. I think that's always where I've found like the, the hardest, the things that look hardest from the inside than the outside. And I think in particular, when I picked up, you know, tax, you know, the credit card tax business and marketing that product when it was in like in year two or three at credit card was just like it, it from the outside it looked like a really tough moment for that business it was you know not growing it had kind of grown it exploded year one and then like struggled in year two and i, and I it, 
it didn't look like a very sensible decision to go in there, but like it's often the best decision you can make to go in and pick pick up something that's broken because it's much easier to like fix something that's broken than it is to sort of op- get something that's humming and working really well and taking that to the next level. So you know, I think I think I'm, I'm always sort of don't be afraid by the taking opportunities that that seem daunting and seem like seem like you're you're onto you know you're, you're picking up something that's that's on the way down because it's often the easiest thing to turn around and 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 that is always where you get the most credit in your career is like getting that that turn, either a turnaround or getting something like you know you know getting meaningfully noticeable results uh, in in a relatively short period of time so i think there's that and i think you know i think i think uh, uh you know the other, going back to the, the the sort of example i had a, i had before is just like make sure that you're that you're passionate about or at least somewhat passionate about what you're doing and you buy into the mission of the company that you're working for because i think without that it's hard to push yourself like beyond it's hard to really like break down barriers if you're if you don't feel that you're you're doing something that's important as well as you know you're building a career and i mean some people do that because i think that they're manage like you know maybe they're focused on the reward or whatever which you know is a different different mindset and and each to their own but for me it's like you know make sure you're passionate about what the company's doing and challenge yourself and never stop learning the moment you stop learning get out of there go somewhere else (laughs) well along those lines like is there a topic you think marketers need to learn more about or or maybe something you're trying to learn more about yourself either way. Yeah. I think for me, it's been, I'm super interested in, in, you know, behavioral psychology, behavioral finance. And I think getting deep on how humans think irrespective of whether it's related to marketing is something that you need to do because I think it helps you to really sort of study the human mind when you're, when you're trying to be a marketer because effectively you're trying to change the way people think about something. If you just look at that, you can look at that purely through the realms of like how marketing is done, how marketing is successful. But I think in that scenario, you're just looking at the output and what output is successful. But you're not understanding like the true reason why behind it. So I think for me, again, when I when I first started out in that sort of marketing switch, I moved to a, uh, I was working at an investment bank called Dresden Climate, and I was there are a few moments in my in my life where I'm like this, this bit of an aha moment, and I work with a. I used to um, do the marketing and the communications around our equity research team. And there was a gentleman there called um, James Montier, who was a behavioral psychology, behavioral finance psychologist. He's a like, super smart guy. And he just like, he was going into the, the, the psychology behind financial decisions. And that was kind of what, what he wrote about. And I found that to be fascinating. And I learned a ton of lessons there that have helped me as I think about building marketing and trying to understand what sort of what appeals to consumers and not just what appeals to consumers, but also like what gets them to take action. Because I think there's two sides to marketing. There's rational and irrational. And often the difference between great marketing is making a rational argument with an irrational, like an irrational kind of decision moment, like drive, because you're trying to get, you know, it, it comes back to taxes, right? You know, when, when I was trying to market taxes, you're trying to get somebody to you know, it's, it's, you're trying to build up a reason. Like, why would you use us? Well, here are the five reasons. Here's where we differentiate. Like, here are our reasons to believe, right? But like, why are you going to do it now? Why are you going to change now? Why are you going to do it this year and so the next year? Why are you going to take this decision and take this action today and now? And again, I think in, in commerce, right, it's it, that you're, you're appealing to a certain, the, will, the sort of the desire to own something, to have something, right? In finance, it's very different. And you have to really think about it that way. Of, you know, how am I going to drive that? How am I going to get the irrational brain to act on the rational? decision quite often that the, that the user has made and so that's it's i think yeah spend time with behavioral science like i go listen to dan early and that will help you a lot yeah yeah funny thing is i used to work i used to share a wall with dan Ariely's team <laughs> it was uh it was quite interesting but yeah i love your comment that you just used it's marketing is a lot of times making a rational argument for the irrational brain. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. It's like you have to convince you have to convince the rational side of the brain. But like once you've done that, your job is not done because you still have to get someone to take action on it. And that is always about like, why do it now? Like ira- like there's, you know, there's a lot of like, there's a lot of irrational. And it's interesting when you do user research, you often find like people will tell you something and I'm saying, well, that, yeah, but if you, if you are, you have to figure out how to 
both ask someone the question and then test them in the re- in reality because you when when you put someone in a rational frame of mind you ask them what they think they will tell you what they think when they're thinking rationally but they won't behave like that and you have to figure out how to close that gap yeah that makes sense makes sense two more questions for you and uh on a personal note are there brands or companies or causes that you follow or you think people should take notice of i mean dave <laughs> <laughs> i set you up for that one didn't i yeah, you do. Um, I think I would, uh, you know, take. I, I think we're on a really interesting journey over the next year or two, and I think as a company, we're, uh, you know, we're, we're like we're certainly going on a really interesting. Our product is something that helps people, particularly in a in a world with high inflation and and high high employment. Right, we're closing that gap between your ability to pay for things and your your ability to, to sort of your own liquidity. So I think I think mean, hey, you know, look at Dave, and hopefully we'll get on your radar at some point in the next in the next sort of three to six months. But I think the for me, I find that I'm most excited by the brands that are trying to push around new platforms and like understand new platforms. And, uh, you know, I think I, I in, the, in the fintech space, you know, I, I there's, uh, you know, Truebill is a great company that, that really sort of like tries to learn how to grow and how to, how to you know, I think I'm, I'm very, uh, I think their marketing is amazing. And I think, I think there's a lot of other companies in, that, that are sort of pushing into there that, that sort of really try and confront these new platforms and leverage these new platforms. So I've always been like cash out to me, which I mean, obviously these, a lot of these are fintech, but you know, they with influencer marketing in particular, like taking that on and really trying to understand it from a financial services perspective. I think I'm always, I'm fascinated by companies that, you know, that, that learn things first and get the advantage from that. It comes back, I think, to understanding from the inside how like important that unlock can be. So I, th- I think I think that's great. I think I think uh, Jilling goes done a great job on on TikTok. I think TikTok is very passe to say this, but like you know, it's it's. Uh, I, I think everyone should be sp- put it, like spending as much of their time trying to figure out TikTok as possible. Um, it's it's such a huge. Yeah, it's at that point, right, where it's still a little bit of the wild west, which means there's still the opportunity to arbitrage it. Um, and I don't feel like it's yet to really get the investment from the big brands and all that. So, so I think that's a, a, I think anyone that's, that's opening there, I think Julian has done a great job with that. So yeah, those are some of the companies that I look at and I, I, I sort of admire. Awesome. And the last question for you, what do you think is the largest opportunity or threat facing marketers today? The biggest opportunity is the biggest threat, <laughs> right? Which is, which is all the changes that we've seen with user, user level tracking for me. And again, I come from performance mark like I'm, I'm at a company that's i think would consider itself to be primarily performance marketing based but you know as part of that you know this move from art to science to some blend of the two i think it un you know i remember asking a couple of people when i first joined credit karma like if we would ever invest in something we couldn't prove a return on and i think the answer there was probably not but didn't quite get a, get a clear answer on that front and i think that historically probably the last five to ten years have been characterized by that where a lot of investment has gone to uh, channels where you can most cleanly prove the return and i think in that scenario you are always capturing the lowest the lowest amount of impact that you're driving right if you're only looking at what you can prove then you ignore all of the upside of the stuff of the impact that you can't prove and that's fine that has been enough in a market where you've been able to prove quite a lot and i think that's why a lot of you know money is, has been going to you know historically has obviously gone to channels where it's easier to track but that's that's going away and i think i think we see that all over the place right now where you know there's there's huge there's opportunities that have emerged with platforms that are harder to track even traditional platforms or, or devices or, or you know where, where it's hard the harder it is to track the more opportunity there is for there and i think that that comes back to the ability to think a little bit more thoughtfully about like measurement and tracking and proving out an roi and not just being like at a hundred percent sort of attached to kind of yeah you know, platform data or, 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 back, or click level data is is going to be a huge unlock because you know you you're there's a lot of opportunity out there if you can if you can just sort of zoom out a little bit and think about things in a way that's data informed but not data driven and so i think that that that's a big opportunity and it's also a big threat i think for a lot of companies that are kind of like looking at this in terms of that old way what i already think consider to be kind of an old school mindset which is what can i prove it's going to get harder and harder well michael thank you so much for coming on the show it's been a lot of fun all right i appreciate it thank you for having me Hi, it's Alan again. Marketing Today was created and produced by me with support from my team and podcast editors, sound engineers, and writers at Share Your Genius. Find them at shareyourgenius.com. If you're new to Marketing Today, 
please feel free to write us a review on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Don't forget to subscribe on marketingtodaypodcast.com and tell your friends and colleagues about the show. I love to hear from listeners. You can contact me on marketingtodaypodcast.com. There you will also find complete show notes, links to what was discussed in the episode today, and you can search our archives. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today.